This morning, I wanted to jump into uh, the passage, 2 Kings chapter seven. I'm gonna give you uh, a second uh, to turn there. And while I do so, I really wanna frame for us uh, why we're going to 2 Kings uh, chapter seven. I wanna kind of frame with, with a couple of stories, uh, man, why we're gonna focus on this uh, passage uh, today. Uh, last summer, I, I moved to uh, Olathe, Kansas, home of uh, Garmin, and moved across the street from, uh, from that property. And, and, and if you've ever owned a new home, uh, you start to learn things uh, about the house as you go through seasons. Uh, right, and so uh, last winter was my first winter uh, in this house, and, and you learn a couple things. Uh, I'd owned a house previously. Uh, the the sub pump had a pipe that went out of the house, and it, it was buried underground, and it sent water out to the, to the backyard uh, for us. Uh, in the winter, I didn't have to worry about that pipe freezing because it was underground. Now I, I moved to this this new house. We go through the winter season. It has an above ground pipe that sends water uh, to the backyard, uh, which is beautiful. However, uh, in my ignorance, I did not take the pipe, the PVC pipe off of the house. And so inevitably for those of you that own a home or responsible for home maintenance, that caused a huge difficulty because the pipe froze uh, to the house. And so I got in this situation where I couldn't get it off. I didn't know what to do. And so I call a, a guy, uh, he comes over to our house and within 45 seconds, he's just like, yep, here's the problem. Here's what you do. This is the solution. And I just, I almost feel like emasculated. I'm like, if that took you 45 seconds to figure out that whole situation, I spent 45 hours of no sleep thinking about. And he said, yeah, here, here's the deal. Uh, I'm in all kinds of these situations. I, I, I've learned how houses work. I've learned how they're set up. I have all of these experiences of, of situations and what's happened. And so I was able to kind of come into your house. And even though it's unfamiliar, uh, I've never been to your particular house before in your particular situation, it's unfamiliar to me. I have all of these things, these principles, these things that I can apply to pretty much know uh, what is, is going on. The same is true for us relationally. Maybe relationally makes more sense for you. At one point in my life, I, I sat down across a table from my wife in something called premarital counseling. All right, has anybody done premarital counseling? This is uh, this few week session where I was convinced walking out of it, we had these awesome conversations about, hey, in life, when this happens, this is what I'm gonna be like, and this is what I'm gonna do. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. In this situation in life, I'm gonna be like this. And you're gonna, yeah, it's gonna be awesome. And I, I learned some things. I learned kind of what my wife valued and, and, and the way that she saw situations. And then comes the actual situation, right? Uh, then comes the actual situation in life. And as you go through these unfamiliar situations, uh, you start to, to really learn the, the character and the nature and, and the values of, of that person that you're walking through life with. When, when you get to the, the diagnosis you weren't expecting and you watch your, your spouse walk through that and you're thinking like, how, is, how are they viewing it? How are they thinking? What do they need? And then you go to, to, to the death in the family, the loss of the job, the financial situation. You start to walk through these unfamiliar situations. You start to learn about the character and nature of that person. In fact, you get pretty good at even understanding how they're going to see the situation, how they're going to apply themselves to the situation. I even know at this point, uh, eight years in, like I even know my wife's Chick-fil-A order. Like I got it down, I got it down pat, right? Hey, and so, so for us, what I want us to see today as we look at 2 Kings chapter seven is that God, his people, this, this nation of Israel, that, that he doesn't just sit across the table one day and try to explain everything about who he is, right? We, we see him explain his heart and his nature, but what we watch him do in the Old Testament using the course of actual human history, uh, real cities, real people, real leaders, real nations, we watch him use this test tube of, of actual human history to start to show his people who he is. That as they walk through unfamiliar situations, that they start to see the heart and the character and the nature of, of God and what he values and how he views the situation. And they're forced to, to kind of wrestle with, with who he is. But for today is, is what I want you to see is that the heart and nature of God is it, it kind of oozes out of the pages of scripture is that we see it all over the place that we don't just see it in the, the familiar stories of scripture. Like, like we see the heart of the gospel that God would look at us who rebelled against him and there's a consequence to that, that he would take upon the consequence on himself on the cross and instead offer us life that we could walk with him and know him and have eternal life. And one day he would restore all things. We see that in the gospel message, this, this climactic moment in the scriptures. 
But as we, as we read the Old Testament, they're not throwaway stories. We see, we see the reality of who God is take place in the Exodus as he parts the seas and makes a way and gives them life out of slavery. We see God's heart and nature over and over again in the, in the story of Jericho that in a way that they don't have to fight, that he would give them a way where he would deserve all of the glory. And, and as you read the Old Testament, it's rich with these stories over and over and over and over again. But God's heart and his character, his nature aren't just available in the stories that you did as flannel grass as a kid in Sunday school, uh, maybe, I don't know, I don't wanna age anybody, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that he's in all of the pages of the Bible, that he's in all of the stories, even in the unfamiliar places. And so today I didn't wanna look at maybe a familiar story that you grew up knowing. I wanted to look at maybe, maybe some, some Bible nerds in here have read this story and are very familiar with it. Uh, but for, for us, I, I wanted to kind of look at what I would call maybe an unfamiliar story uh, in the Old Testament because I want you to see that God's heart does not change, that, that God's heart and who he is and how he views the world and what he has to offer, that it spills out even in this unfamiliar story circumstance. My hope would be as we walk out today that as you encounter more unfamiliar circumstances in your life, that you would walk out more confident than ever that God does not change, uh, that the way that we see him interact in the scriptures also applies today, that he has so much to offer through life in Christ to, to know him and to walk with him. And so we're gonna be in 2 Kings chapter seven today. Bear with me, it's an unfamiliar story. So as you're reading, there might be some confusion. We're gonna, we're gonna step back after we're done and kind of, kind of walk through it and help us see uh, what God is doing here in this passage. So you have your Bible. We're gonna be in 2 Kings chapter seven. We're gonna start in verse three, uh, but as we get to the sermon, we'll, we'll, we'll step back just a little bit to get some context in chapter six. So 2 Kings seven, verse three. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit here, we, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they sp spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose at twilight to go to camp of the Assyrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sounds of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, behold, the king of Israel has hired, us, hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, we came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard there nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. Then the gatekeepers called out and it was told within the king's household. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Assyrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country thinking when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants said, let us take some men, five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will, will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So they took two horsemen and the king sent after them the army of the Syrians saying, go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So as we look at this story today, where we see this unfamiliar story we're gonna watch and see how the heart and nature of God is not contained to one story in scripture, but spills out in everything. So the first thing that I wanna note in this unfamiliar story, number one, is that death is certain. Death is 
certain. I want to back up so you understand the context of what is, what is happening in this, in this strange story. So we back up to chapter six. and I, I want you to see it kind of outlines this, the, the overarching situation. In chapter six, verse 24, we see Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. This is what happens. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria and they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cob of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. And so this is, this is what's happened, right? That, that maybe you're not familiar with the word besiege, but maybe you're from more, more familiar with the word blockade, right? So the, the, the Northern kingdom of Israel, its capital city, Samaria, uh, is being besieged by the Syrians. So the Syrians just North of them come down and they surround the city of Samaria, this, this capital city of the Northern kingdoms of Israel, surrounded them. There's nothing that can get in there's nothing that can get out. And so they're stuck there. And not only that, there's a famine in the land. So there's nothing growing inside of the city. There's nothing available for them to survive on. And so what we see happen is the situation has gotten so dire inside of the kingdom gates that you kind of saw it's, it's hard to, to stomach literally and figuratively that, that they were starting to, to buy donkey's heads right? This is not a figure of speech. This is not a delicacy uh, in, a, in an old world. This is as it seems, that, that people were gathering their money uh, for adjustment of in, inflation, uh, about a couple hundred dollars for a donkey's head that they could put at their dinner table and hopefully feed to their family. Therefore, they could make it another night as this siege is taking place around the city, starving them out. But if that wasn't good enough, if they didn't have a couple hundred dollars, they would spend maybe $40, $50 adjusted to inflation for like a liter of dove's dung. You can imagine as you, you sit around the table going, I hope that this uh, fulfills us and sustains us for another day so that we don't die. And so the people inside of the gates are, are, are living life with, with this incredibly difficult circumstance. They know that death is imminent. And they're inside of these walls trying to figure out solutions, trying to figure out what they're going to do to evade death as it slowly creeps closer and closer and closer. You can imagine the king's men are, are thinking, what if, what if we tried this policy? What if this policy would help us uh, elongate our time here a little bit longer? What if, what if we waited out? Maybe they'll, they'll give up. Maybe they'll give up of what they're doing out there and they, they come up with this new strategy and plan. Maybe others, uh, they, others we see in the text have, have actually come up with ways to, to eat other people's children, very next there in, in chapter six, that that's their plan. That's what they come up with. That they're so desperate inside of the city that they start coming out with these crazy plans. The one thing that they don't do, what they never do in these Northern tribes over the course of 20 Kings is they never submit to God. That they're convinced, the people in the city are convinced we can just wait it out long enough. We can come up with a different strategy. We can do something different and eventually we'll figure this thing out and it will go away. In fact, we see in verse 33, not only uh, do, they, do they try to figure out their own solutions and not submit to God, they even blame God that the king, as he sends his messenger to Elisha, that, that the king sees the circumstance and he blames God. Look at verse 33. While he was still speaking with them, the messenger came to him and said, this trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? This trouble certainly was allowed by the Lord, but comes from, as we know in our Old Testament history, their refusal to submit to God. That God says, as you refuse to submit to me, as you worship other idols, calamity will come. And I want you to see that apart from me, death is imminent. So we see the first reality in this story is that death is certain. We are facing the same reality. The scriptures say in Ephesians that we are born as objects of the wrath of God, that, that our rebellion and our sin, that death, maybe you don't sit around your dinner table with a, a donkey head or dove dung, but death is certainly just as imminent spiritually. That without Christ, without God intervening, uh, that we look at our lives and, and deserve nothing but judgment. That, that for us, as we live our lives trying to distract ourselves, trying to forget of, of this outside death that is certainly waiting and coming for us. We try to distract ourselves with different strategies, whether that's work or family or, or finances or, or talents or, or riches, whatever it is that we're in the city gates per se, trying to figure out how we can make much of this thing ourselves. God looking at us going, man, would you just surrender? 
And so the first thing that we see, not only for this tribe, but we see that death is certain, not only for them, but for us. The second thing we see in this story, God's heart spilling out of how he views things is God's word is trustworthy. God's word is trustworthy. So we see the circumstance, we see the situation, and Elisha, the the messenger of God, the one that speaks the words of God, comes into the situation and proclaims something different. So there's the way that everyone sees the situation, and then there's what Elisha says is the way that God sees the situation. So in the midst of death, verse one and two of chapter seven, Elisha says this, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a say of flour shall be sold for a shekel and two says of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose the, can, uh, the king had leaned said to the man, if the Lord himself make windows into heaven, could this thing be? But he said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so Elisha comes on the scene, recognizing everyone's seeing the same physical circumstances. Everyone's seeing the same list of things that are going on. But Elisha comes in and says, hey, in 24 hours, by tomorrow, God is gonna completely flip this thing on his head. Like you're gonna go from eating donkey and dove, you're gonna go from that to you can buy as much barley and as much flour as you could ever imagine for cheap. And so the messenger of God goes, Elisha, that's ridiculous. The the word of the Lord, it it doesn't make sense. That's not logistically possible. The only way that change is gonna happen around here is if we get the right circumstances, the right situation, we all do this and we all work together over time, we can flip this thing and we got this. And Elisha says, no, 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 no. The only way this situation is gonna change because the word of the Lord has come and it is true. As, as those people wrestle in the room, you can imagine wrestle with the messenger's word versus the word from the Lord. You can imagine that we wrestle with the same thing. That as we look at our circumstances in the world and go, man, how is that ever gonna be good? Or man, that, that, I, that's never gonna change. I can't imagine this. How, in the, how is the Lord going to work? We wrestle with our, our Bibles and we see the word of the Lord saying, hey, I have not given up, that I will come and restore all things that I give, I give peace to those who would know me. I give the, the forgiveness of sin, that there are riches in me if you know me. And we're faced, just like them, to evaluate and say, Man, do I believe the words of the world or do I believe the words of God? And so not only is death is imminent, uh, but God's word is trustworthy. We move on to number three, that surrender is necessary. Surrender is necessary. Necessary. I love this story if you see in verse three and four. The main characters of this story, this is, this is awesome to me. The main characters of the story are four lepers. It, it's not really the king. It's not even really Elisha in this, in this story. It, it's really these four lepers. I love this because God selects them as displaying uh, some characteristics and who he is and, and, and how to interact with him uh, through the literally the least maybe the least liked characters in all of the Old Testament, right? You can imagine these lepers, four of them, leprosy, this skin condition that they believed was, was this curse of God, that, that people wouldn't be around them. Think about this. If the people in the city gates are eating donkey and dove and human beings, imagine the lepers who sit outside of the, the city gate who depend on the generosity of others as they walk by to give them out of their abundance sustaining food. Imagine the lepers as they sit out there going, there is no hope for us. We we cannot fix these circumstances. There's there's nothing inside of ourselves that we could do to change this situation. I love that God picks these characters, the four lepers, as the ones who are the main characters of this story. The ones who have nothing to offer. They have no skill, they have no beauty, they have no finances, and God says, I'm going to select them to show my glory. In fact, the the only qualification, the only characteristic that these four lepers have to offer is that they're needy, is that they're dependent. And God looks at them and goes, yes, those are the people that I'm gonna show my glory through. And so we see these four lepers faced with really an easy decision for them. We have no hope, and so we will just surrender. We will surrender. We cannot fix these things. As the people in the city gates come up with strategies and try to elongate this thing, we're just going to surrender. And the same is true for us. We lay down the things that preoccupy us and don't actually work or give us value. And we say, Lord, I cannot fix my heart. 
I cannot fix my circumstances. I cannot fix the sin that I'm addicted to. I cannot fix the sin that impacts and and breaks my family. I can't fix any of those things. And so I know that the only thing I have to offer is surrender. And just like the lepers, that we, we, we understand that the gospel message says, well, we surrender our lives and allow God to work. So not only is death imminent, not only has God's word been spoken and, and we have to believe it's true, but we must surrender, which leads us to point number four in this unfamiliar story, that death has been defeated. Death has been defeated. I love this. Did you see what happens in the story? The, the lepers, they surrender. They go out to the enemy's camp and you can imagine this moment in their life where they thought for sure they were going to die. That as they approach the camp, They see garments on the ground. They see gold and silver pieces just left. They see horses and donkeys tied up and there's no one there. As they walk from tent to tent and realize that all of their problems are solved, like all of their brokenness, all of their issues, all of their famine, it's over. That they have more than enough. You can imagine this moment of just dancing and celebrating as it just kind of waves over them. It dawns over them that they're saved, that they don't have to experience the reality of what they've been subjected to for the last several months. You can imagine as they put on, I don't know, their culture's equivalent to some Taylor Swift songs and start dancing and throwing up money in the air. You can imagine they're just like eating things just to eat them. They're, they're like looking at the donkeys and horses and imagining for the first time them riding them. And you can imagine just the joy that protruded where they realized that death had been defeated. Not because they had done anything, but God had come on the scene. You see there in the text, that God was the one that initiated all of it, that he had caused the army to flee, that they come on the scene in which they did not deserve, which they did not labor for. And they recognized that God had won a victory. The same is true in our lives as we surrender, that we realize that we can't just fix our sin and brokenness, that we have nothing to to just cover up things with, that, that we're completely relying on God, that he comes And he washes away our past. He washes away our sin. He washes away the judgment and punishment that is certain to meet us. And he gives us instead the riches of this relationship with with Christ. That that we get the riches of, of peace instead of worry. We get the riches of forgiveness instead of guilt and shame. We get the, the riches of hope that one day he'll come back and restore all things. We get to live with these riches in joy. But this is where the story, I really want you to see verse nine. This is where, uh, man, I love verse nine. I hope that you caught it as we read it. Verse nine, let me read it one more time just because I want you to see it. The lepers, then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. See, point number five is that good news is to be shared. You can imagine yourself in the story as they're, as they're living it up for the first time in their lives, like we have everything we could ever imagine. Someone kind of stops and gives the side eye and goes, wait a second, this is not, this is not right. There's, there's more than we could, we could ever consume ourselves. There's more than we could ever need here. There's people in the city that are living a reality that is not true. That there's, there's people in the city that think the only thing they can do to survive is to eat dove and, and, and donkey. That They don't recognize that sin, that, that death has been defeated. They, they live in this constant reality of death encroaching on them when it does not have to be true for them. That the enemy has been defeated. And you can just recognize this moment where they realize, ah, salvation's not, I can't keep this to myself. We can't, just, we can't just enjoy the riches that there's people in the city that need to know that this truth exists, that they're living in the wrong reality. What I also about, love about the lepers is that the people in the city, are, they're not their friends. The people in the city are the ones that would walk by them every day and they were an inconvenience. There's something to be scoffed at and spit upon and ignore and avoid. But as they enjoyed the riches God had won salvation and saved their lives. They went from death to life. That their heart, if it it was anything like I recognize sometimes in myself, would be like, yeah, those guys deserve it. 
But they recognized because they did not deserve what they were enjoying, that the people inside the city gates, even though they had treated them terribly their whole lives, that they needed to share with them that they could also possess and obtain what they had found. And so for us, and as we enjoy the riches of knowing Christ, as we live with hope and peace and mercy and grace, and would we, as we enjoy the riches, as it says in 2 Corinthians, as we experience the God of all comfort, would we also go out and proclaim the riches, the comfort of knowing our heavenly Father? In fact, this is point number six. Not only is good news meant to be shared, but that skepticism is to be expected. I don't know if you notice in the story that as the four lepers, you can kind of imagine, right? Four lepers come to the city gate where they had just sat in desperation. They come back with a different message. They proclaim to everyone who will listen, the army is gone. There's, there's no one out there. Like the thing that you've been living your life for, it actually doesn't exist. It's not real. All of the people are gone. You can go out and enjoy. We've got all of this, this stuff out there. You can imagine as people, they had walked by for forever and look down upon, they go, okay, sure, four lepers, great, good story. And, and, and you, can, you can tell kind of in the text that they, they don't even stop it once, they, they proclaim it again. They're, they're trying to persuade, they, they recognize what is at stake here. They recognize that death and life are at stake and so they, they can't stop, they just, they keep going. They're trying to help them understand that, that, that the enemy has been defeated but their skepticism is certainly understandable as you go through life and try to proclaim what Christ has done for you, the reality of who Jesus is and and, and what he has accomplished on our behalf and what you can have in him. Certainly you can understand why someone would, would listen to the truths of the gospel and say, hey, the creator of the universe actually wants to know you specifically. In fact, he knows that you've turned your back on him over and over and over again, but instead of treating the way that you should be treated, he actually sent his son to die for those consequences. That if you would just put your faith, if you would just surrender and put your faith in him, that you could actually be forgiven of your sins. And not only that, that Jesus came back from the grave proclaiming that you also don't have to experience death, but you can know him forever and live with him forever as he restores his creation. You can imagine someone would sit there and go, Okay, man, <laughs> yeah, all right. But, but we persuade, we start to show them like, this is how it's impacted my life. I, I used to have a ton of anxiety around this subject, but as I, I focus on who Jesus is, man, he's helped me in that. I, I used to have this brokenness in my family and certainly it's not perfect, but Jesus has stepped in and showed me how to, how to sacrifice and love and give of myself and die to myself. Uh, this, this thing over here and this thing over here and this thing over here, and you start to trace the outline of what it looks like to walk with Jesus. And maybe, just like in the story, did you notice what they did? They go, some of them go, what if we just sent a delegate? What if we explored a little bit? What if we sent a delegation? That, the, the implications of that are so big. What if we just explored it a little bit to see if it was true? And, and they go out to kind of explore. It, are some of the things that the levers talked about, are they coming true? And for us, it's the same way as we, we, we invite people to watch our lives. We invite people to see how, how Jesus reframes things and informs things and, and they start to see them as true. It starts to gain traction that the Lord will change their heart and their mind to see the gospel is certainly true. But I have one illustration I wanted to show you because I think uh, this, this helps uh, us understand how difficult it is. This is a student ministry special right here. Uh, so this is a, a picture. Uh, it's called an optical illusion. Uh, and so in this picture, I know it's a little stretched out. Uh, some of people in the room see that picture on the wall and all they see is a bunch of weird black and white squiggly lines that are just going everywhere. Is anybody like, that's just a bunch of black and white squiggly lines, anybody? There's some in the room that see a, a young lady, a young lady. And so uh, raise your hands in the room. Uh, does anybody see a young lady? A young lady, all right. Cool. So some people see the picture, they're a young lady, all right? Some people in the room, they're like, I have no idea what kind of young lady that you're looking at. The, the lady that I see is at least 125 years old, uh, that there's an old lady in this picture. Does anybody see the old lady? All right, and, and then there's some people in the room that are like, I can see both. I can see both pictures. I won't have you to raise your hand, no bragging here, all right? So you can see both pictures, and so for us, what I love is you can already start to see it in the room. That what happens is if the person next to you can't see it, what happens is your family member, the person next to you, they start to try to trace the outline for you. 
They start to look at the nose and go, look at this little button nose that's kind of facing forward. Like, can, you, can you see the hair and the plume? Can you see the young lady looking that way? And then for others, they're like, oh, you don't, you don't see the picture of, of the old lady? That, there's a chin kind of on the bottom with like these weird lips and, and, and really this, this big part of the young lady's cheek is the, is the nose and you can see her hair coming from the bonnet and they start to trace the outline for you. And even more, as the people start to trace the outline, there's times in the room where people go, I see it for the first time. I see both pictures. And you get the reward of of trying to show them where things are. For us in our lives, as we explain the gospel truths to people, you're going to see the same realities. You're gonna see some people that are like, hey, I only see the physical world. I only see these physical circumstances around me. All All I can give my life to is what's happening around me. You're you're gonna see some people come on the scene and say, hey, there's actually this second picture. There's actually this other reality that controls the first. There's there's this God of the universe that has a different agenda. Let me try to to trace it for you. Let me try to help you see it in in our lives as, as, as we try to trace it and show people the best we can that those pictures are coinciding. Hopefully there's some, their eyes and their hearts and their minds will be awakened to realize, to see it for the first time. See, for us, we're line tracers. We're people that get to proclaim the truths of the gospel and show people that they can see too. And then lastly, not only do we expect skepticism and push through it, lastly, we see this difficult reality of the last point, unbelief is punished. Unbelief is punished. You see God completely flip and change these circumstances as his word said he would. But the man who refused to believe, the man who's opposed to God, the messenger at the gate, meets the same reality that God's word also promised, meets his own demise and judgment. You look at verse 17 and 18. Now the king had appointed the captain on whose he leaned to have charge of the gate. The people trampled him in the gate so that he died. And as the man of God said, when the king came down to him, for when the man of God had said to the king, Two says of barley shall be sold for a shekel and a sea of fine flour for a shekel about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria. So what happens? God punishes the unbelief of the messenger. This is a harsh reality. It's fun to talk about the heart and nature of God in this unfamiliar circumstance, as long as it's confined to the love of his riches and the sharing of his riches with others. But the unfortunate reality is that that unbelief is punished by God that those who refuse to give up their stronghold on their own lives, refuse to surrender, refuse to surrender to Christ, the ultimate end is still punishment, that that is his heart and his character. As the band comes to play in conclusion, our hopes are here at Fellowship Aletha that as you wrestle with the gospel, as you wrestle with the truths of God, that you would not hold dear and, and hold tight to your own devices, but that you would do exactly that, that you would surrender to the truth of the gospel. Maybe for some in the room, that's, that's your reality, that, that, that you've tried to, to kind of cover up with your life uh, the, the notion that death is one day imminent, that you try not to think about it, you try not to, uh, to put it out there, that you, you preoccupy yourself with your daily lives to, to not think about the spiritual reality. Maybe today is the first time that you would just surrender to that. Say, hey, I don't have a solution. I cannot fix myself. I am broken, Lord, I need you to do that. I would love to talk to you here at the front uh, as the band plays. Maybe some in the room, uh, man, you are believers, that you've experienced that salvation of, of thinking you were going to die, but realizing for the first time that Christ had made you alive and you get to revel and joy in that celebration. But maybe today is the first time where the Lord said, hey, there's the others that are dying. There are others that are, are not living in a reality of truth. Maybe today for the first time as you, you throw up your riches and, and revel of them, you're like, man, I, I need to share them. There's, there's more that could ever be exhausted that, that others need to know the riches of Christ. Maybe some of you in the room are trying to do that. And there's just skepticism at every front. Honestly, that that makes sense. If you grapple with the reality of how big this truth is, skepticism makes sense. But would you not stop there? Would your life be the sermon illustration? Would your life start to trace the lines of how the gospel can bring life to a human being? Would you start to trace the lines for people and show them the other picture that God truly is who he says he is? Our hope here at Fellowship Aletha that we would have more stories and more stories of baptism. We get to celebrate and clap and cheer as we watch the joy of salvation emanate 
from God changing hearts and minds. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for who you are. I pray today as we look at an unfamiliar story that we would see a familiar God, that we would see a, a, a God who loves his people, who doesn't want them to expire, but wants them to know that he loves them and cares for them and has a, a great plan for their life. Lord, I pray today in this room as we worship you, that you would continue to move in this place, Lord, that if anybody in their heart and mind just needs to surrender, Lord, would you, would you do that work? Would you do that work as only you can? We're just trusting you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.